Hello and welcome to part two of seven, which is quite disturbing to think about, but yes, it's part two of seven of aircraft carriers in the 1920s and 1930s. And this is looking at the Arthur John's paper of 1934. So, expect me to be reading a fair bit from this. What can I say? It has everything in it. And... The London and Washington Treaties. So these will be coming up. Now, before I get into it, I should also explain about some of the videos coming up because there's been various dis there's various discussions about what they're going to be. Part three is going to be what were the carriers doing. What were they for? What were they doing? Why was anyone building an aircraft carrier in the 1920s and 30s? Part four, we'll look at the aircraft carriers of the Big Three in the 1920s. The Big Three, of course, being Britain, Japan, the United States of America. Part five is going to look at the French and the German navies and their aircraft carrier plans. Because it's important to think about what they were capable of, what they were thinking about, what anyone who just didn't have a navy, but who was trying to start off one, was really going to start off with, you know, didn't have an aircraft carrier navy, and rephrase that, and was trying to start off one, was going to think about. And also the ideas that both come up with, which is pretty darn interesting. They're interesting ideas. I'm not sure I'd actually implement them because they're interesting workarounds and solutions, but they create problems in their own right. But that's for something else. Then part six, we'll look at the 1930s carriers of the Big Three again. And then part seven will be a bit of a summary. The aircraft carrier is a coming capital ship in an era where it was quite common that capital ships were not just, there was not just one type of capital ship. Which seems strange, but you already have the battle cruiser and the battleship, which are two very different ships. Two, they look very similar on the outside, but they're very different in terms of their emphasis of role and how that structures the ship internally, and what emphasis is put on what in terms of machinery or armor. Size of guns. Is just size of guns. The size of a ship is just the size of a ship. What matters is how these things are put together and why they're put together in that way in defining what a ship does. And one capital ship does not necessarily have to be the same as another capital ship to still be a capital ship. Because a capital ship has a very specific phraseology, as long as the same as an escort has a very specific phraseology. A capital ship is a vessel which has presence, no matter where it goes, which has status as a primary vessel, which can probably be used for command, which will be a vessel which will be considered at the strategic level of wherever it's deployed, i.e. In the nicest way, capital ships, their movements, are often as much up to the decisions of politicians as they are admirals, because they matter. That's why Force Z ends up in a place where none of the admirals really wanted it, because the politicians wanted it there, because they thought it'd be enough. This is why, recently, if anyone's watching, you, it's January 2021. USS Nimitz is extending her deployment in the Gulf. Why? Well, it's a 10 month deployment, it's a massive deployment. It's going to be really damaging to the ship. But 
one nation, Iran, has made threats against the leadership of America. Love them or hate them, it's not a really sensible thing to do. And so the aircraft carrier is staying there. They're also enriching uranium. It's fun times at the moment. Anything... The thing is, if it's not those sort of requirements, it's probably not a capital ship. If you consider the deployment of cruisers in the 1920s to 1930s, no politician would probably be worried about where an individual cruiser was. Do we have a squadron in that region? Yes, that's fine. Would have been no worry. Do we have a battleship? Would have been a different question. Presidents apparently ask, where are the aircraft carriers? Where's the nearest carrier? They don't ask, where's the nearest destroyer? They presume there's one nearby. And if there's a carrier, they presume there's a whole lot of them nearby. They're escorts. So, it's Arthur John's 1934 paper. Now, normally, when I start talking about these papers, especially when I do discussions on them, I start off with the discussions of them, because for my work, the discussions are often far more interesting than anything else. However, not today. The leading navies have adopted the aircraft carrier as a necessary type of warship. And with her older sisters, the capital ship, the aircraft carrier in 1934 in the views of Sir Arthur Johns is not in the capital ship category. But that's probably he's using that phrase because he's including both battle cruisers and battle uh, ships and he doesn't want to differentiate. The cruiser and the destroyer Different vessels on different levels. The newcomer has been limited by the Washington and London treaties in unit displacement, in total displacement for Navy, and in calibre of the main armament. Again, this speaks more of Sir Arthur Johns, who is the outgoing director of naval construction in 1934, than it does of the Royal Navy's thinking necessarily at the time it's coming in. Admiral Henderson, remember, is appointed third sea lord in 1933. He's a former rear admiral in aircraft carriers. In fact, that's his assignment before coming in. That's quite a to go into command. He's probably not someone who's sitting there thinking, "Yeah, aircraft carriers, the main caliber of their uh, the uh, the caliber of their main armament. Their main armament is their guns." No, and. The gentleman who's taking over after Sir Arthur Johns, of course, definitely not that type of individual. London Treaty defines an aircraft carrier as any surface vessel of war, whatever its displacement, designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft, and so constructed that aircraft can be launched therefrom and landed thereon. By the Washington Treaty, the standard displacement must not exceed 27,000 tons, and the caliber of the gun must not exceed 8 inch. By the terms of the same carrier uh, treaty, the British Empire and the United States may each have a total tonnage of carriers of 135,000 tons, and Japan 81,000 tons, and France and Italy 60,000 tons. So basically, France and Italy are allowed two 27,000 ton carriers plus 6,000 tons left over for I don't know what. Japan's allowed free 27,000 ton carriers, and Britain and USA are allowed five 27,000 ton aircraft carriers. Someone asked me once why the RN starts looking so carefully at trying to produce 22,000 ton aircraft carriers. Well, if you start doing that, you work out that you can get about six of those out of it. But ideally, you need more tonnage. And that is the one thing you have to admit with the aircraft carrier tonnage. They are rather tight-fisted. By definition, those vessels which were fitted out during the war, that's World War One, 
and arranged so that aircraft could be flown off but not landed on are now termed seaplane carriers, since the aircraft used must be of that description. The Albatross of the Royal Australian Navy, the Commandant Teste of the French Navy, are the latest examples of this type. Their tonnage is not included in that allowed by the Washington Treaty. Woohoo, someone in the Admiralty is crying out in happiness on that one. It was also agreed, apparently, in Chapter 1, Article 9 of the uh, Washington Treaty. Any of the contracting powers may, provided its total tonnage allowance of aircraft carriers is not exceeded, build not more than two aircraft carriers, each of not more than 33,000 tons tonne displacement, in order to affect economy, any of the contracting powers may use for this purpose any two of their ships which otherwise would be scrapped. As a result of these exceptions, the United States authorities has decided to convert Lexington and Saratoga, Japan, the Akagi and Amagi, and all four vessels had originally been battle cruisers, and in advanced state of construction. Amagi was seriously damaged in the Great Earthquake of 1923, and Kaga, a battleship, was selected in her place. So that's where Kaga and Akagi come from, and why there are some differences in them. In the United States, the probable usefulness of aircraft for naval purposes was soon appreciated and proposals made for tests on ships. On November 14, 1910, Eugene Eli, a former employee of the Glenn Curtis, flew an aircraft from a platform 32, 82 feet long and 24 feet wide, inclined at 5 degrees to the horizontal, and erected at a forward weather deck of the United States cruiser AAU Birmingham. The available run was 57 feet. And Eli, when he left the platform, had not reached flying speed, but attained it by skillfully utilising the height above the water of 37 feet. Two months later, January 18th, 1911, Eli successfully landed on a platform 120 feet long and 32 feet wide, built at a slope of 2.5 degrees over the quarter deck of the United States cruiser Pennsylvania. 22 wires, three feet apart, each with 50-pound sandbags on either end, were stretched transversely across the platform and maintained at 12 inch above it by two longitudinal rails. A projection was fitted on the other end of the carriage to catch the wires and decelerate the machine. In landing, the aftermost 11 wires were passed over, but the remainder were engaged, and the airplane came to rest over the foremost, and 50 foot above the transverse canvas screen rigged at the forward end of the platform to catch the airplane in the event of the arresting wires failing to stop it. 45 meters, uh, minutes later, Eli flew off the platform. That is the beginning of the aircraft carriers. And what is interesting is they have various ideas. Some people at the beginning are thinking of an aircraft carrier like the vessel on the left of the screen. as you know, It's got a double sort of island structures. It looks kind of like HMS Thundera, um, with a gap in the middle for aircraft to land off and take off through... Good luck to those pilots. And on the right of the screen is Ark Royal, a uh, forerunner of Pegasus, of Pegasus which, well, for, pre, by this point named Pegasus, because uh, Ark Royal is going to be used for an aircraft car a, a proper aircraft carrier, but that is a seaplane carrier. As you can see, aircraft can take off from it, but they cannot land. And mostly by this time, the aircraft are getting a bit big to take off from it as well. He goes further, and he starts talking about the various carriers. The aircraft carriers in 1934. 
Eight of the carriers are of the island type, with the funnels, mast, navigating position deck on the starboard of the flight deck, outside of the flight deck. The remaining seven have the flush or clear type of flight deck. United States Ranger, designed with a flush flight deck, has been altered to the island type during construction. In the flush deck carrier, the dispersal of the boiler smoke and gases so that they shall not inconvenience pilots about land on is a problem, whose solution is indicated on some of the silhouettes. Argus and Furious have horizontal ducts on either side, immediately under the flight deck and extending almost to the stern, where they are bent downwards, the contents being forcibly directed to the sea, where they are in great part condensed on deposited. Kaya, Kega has similar ducts, but with the outer higher. Hoshos, uh, free funnels, which project above the flight deck when upright, are hinged and turned outboard and horizontal when flying operations are in progress, the two much smaller funnels on Langley are stated to be fitted similarly. Akagi has a similar a single funnel on starboard side, horizontal and transverse, with the outer end turned down, while Ryuju's two funnels are traverse and horizontal. The trend of design is to that of the island type of carrier, experience having shown that if the obstacle is short, relatively narrow, and streamlined, there is little or no interference with the air currents over the after portion of the flight deck. In a small carrier, such as Ryuju, where the length is shorter and the breadth of flight deck is appreciably less than in the larger vessels, the relatively larger breadth of the island may cause serious interference. The island arrangement is generally lighter and allows of a wider and cooler hangar and increased storage for aircraft. It has a disadvantage of making the ship arrangements in the vicinity unsymmetrical, tending to make navigation at times a little difficult and introducing a healing moment, which is of some concern to the ship's officers in maintaining the ship upright. In the Glorious and Courageous, this lack of symmetry is represented by 14,000 foot tons, but in Lexington and Saratoga, where the four twin 8-inch guns are in the same four and a half line as the island, this moment must be far greater and more troublesome. Now please note the phrase used there. There is little or no interference of air currents are over the after portion of flight deck. Why does that matter? Because all these carriers, all of them, are built for aircraft to land aft. Take off forward, land to the aft. Hang on. All of them are going that way. So take off um, on the picture. Take off in the aft. No, take off. <laughs> all right. So uh, it's take off forward. And land aft. That lines up the picture. It's trouble having it looking at me. A glance at the silhouettes it shows that in ten carriers, three British, four USA, two Japanese, and the French, there is one flight deck which extends over the whole length of the ship on Elisa. So. so. Whilst the other five, the flight deck is stopped at an appreciable distance from the valve, thus allowing for a short takeoff or flying off deck below the main one. Different methods of aircraft allocation account for these two arrangements of the decks. Basically, here is the trick. So, it takes a what time? It always takes a time for me to use a lift to get aircraft up to the flying deck. Now, if you're dealing with a fleet carrier, if you've got a cruiser carrier, that's a term I like to use, well, they're out with the cruising formations, they will have some fighters on them, but honestly, their role is not air defense of the force, it's air defense of themselves. However, look here, look at the, fl the fleet carriers. The fleet carriers are furious, courageous, and glorious. I'm not going to say burn, but definitely Akagi and Kaga. And Lexington and Saratoga. Mm, potentially Ranger, but we'll leave that to one side for a moment. Why do they have lower flying off positions? 
In some cases, why do they have three flying off positions? Well, it's to get fighters in the air quickly. You would store it and burn and various others did this. You have the fighters stored at the front. Burn has three lifts. Scout aircraft stored in the middle. Torpedo aircraft at the back. The Burns lifts will go through in a second are sort of designed to fit around this, you know, with the fastest being at the front for the fighters and the slowest at the back for the torpedo bombers. With all these other carriers, that's exactly the similar policy will be carried on. The fighters, when they're in the hangar, will be at the front. Then there'll be the scout aircraft and the spotting aircraft, and then there'll be the torpedo bombs. Now, you are not going to get a torpedo bomb off that lower takeoff position. Not unless it's not carrying a torpedo. And it's got a lot of prayers. A lot of prayers. Maybe some of the scout aircraft might go, but a fairy Blackburn or a fairy 3F, I would not want to try. A, very, uh, a Blackburn Blackburn or a fairy 3F, I would not want to try. I know, I just said a fairy black man. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm going to own the mistake and leave it in. But, a fairy free F might. And the thing is, for all these ones, you can get... Sop with camel, or all the various fairy fly catchers and other little fighters off those flight decks. That means they can launch straight away, so you can keep some ready to go constantly. So the moment you see something coming, because it is going to be line of sight, remember this is all pre-radar. So the earliest you're going to do is maybe a picket destroyer or a picket aircraft spots the enemy aircraft coming in, radios in, dun -dun -dun, zoom. Fighters are away. So in a very real way, you need to think about those lower flying off positions not as some sort of anachronism, but something analogous to the Viper launch tubes on Battlestar Galactica. They are there to rapidly launch the fighters, to get the fighters out as quickly as possible, because you don't have much time. Yes, they're not as cool, and they don't have those flashing lights and various other things, but that is what they are. The reason we get end up getting rid of them is because even the fighters get too big to use them, so there's no point anymore. And then, thankfully, we develop radar and fuel, have enough fuel to maintain a cap. That's a combat air patrol, but... And eventually even airborne early warning. Despite some navies deciding to get rid of it. Well, rather, the government's deciding to get rid of it because they don't want to spend the money. Anyway, here are the aircraft carriers and an overview of the ones we're going to be talking about. And it's rather quite, uh, rather cool. There is Argus, date of completion 1918, Hermes, 1924, Eagle, 1924, Furious, 1925. Courageous, 1928. Glorious, 1930. You know, there's something interesting there. By 1930, the Royal Navy has two, four, six carriers in commission. The Americans have two, four, six, seven, but three of those are still under cons uh, construction. Nowhere in completion, and so that is four by 1934. Japanese are the same. Four by 1933, with two more under construction. And France has to burn. 
So when I say that in the 1920s, the Navy with the most carrier experience is the Royal Navy, that's not me making an idle boast. That's not me being jingoistic. That's not anyone being jingoistic. The Royal Navy has four carriers on its books by 1925. Yes, Saratoga, Lexington, uh, Kagi and Kaga are all large air groups. In fact, Kaga, uh, Lexington and Saratoga are all bigger than anything the Royal Navy's got out there. But they come into service in 1927 and 1928. In that, uh, between uh, sort of during that time, the Royal Navy's had two 15 aircraft carriers in service, a 21 aircraft carrier in service, and a 35 aircraft carrier in service for a good few years. It gives them experience. Admittedly, those carriers are what I would classify as cruiser carriers for the escort role, but that's what the Royal Navy needed them for. And then there's this point. So cool, I've put it in here as a picture from the book. Speaking of changes in design, I think that probably HMS Furious is an outstanding example of a ship which has been modified more completely and more often than any other vessel of which I've ever heard. Although this remark applies to a great extent to Curious and Glorious, and also to the Eagle, which was originally a battleship. The Furious, Glorious, and Courageous began as very fast cruisers for pursuing any commerce raiders which might get into the high seas and harry our mercantile marine. I, remember the, I well remember the instructions that Lord Fisher, who was then First Sea Lord, gave me regarding these vessels, when he pointed out that in the early days of the war, all the best and fastest cruisers which we had were kept with the main fleet, more or less, in home waters, and the older and slower ships were sent out on the seven seas far away from home to protect our worldwide commerce routes. Alluding to the exploits of the German cruiser Emden and others, he said, Those old uh, these old ships are no good. And his cogent, uh, cogent and incisive manner, he pointed out that when a hare gets away in the turnip field and begins to eat your produce, it's no good, in spite of Asop's failable, sending out tortoises to catch it, even hundreds of them. What is wanted is a greyhound. So these vessels were put in hand to carry a small number of big guns and act as greyhounds of the ocean. That also fits with their carrier role, but... And I say this with no pretensions. I wish the Hood class had been further on in production. Because I have a feeling if the animals had been further along production, it might have been two of them rather than Courageous and Glorious, which got the built. And they might have been slightly bigger, and therefore might not have been so quite so easily discarded. Mm, well, when I say discarded, I mean allowed to wander off without proper escort. There is something about the size of carrier, the fact that they are from large light cruisers, which does give a certain naval officer a certain perspective. But the other point I'm trying to make here is this. Look at how many of these carriers are being built. That's a lot of ships. That is a lot of ships. There aren't that many battleships being built in this same period. Admittedly, they're limited by treaty. They're dreaming of them, but they're not building them. They're building carriers. You can have the treaty allowance. You don't necessarily have to build it. You can save your money. That's what the French do. That's what the Italians do. The Italians have the allowance for 60,000 tons of aircraft carriers. And Quila doesn't really start production until World War II is already well underway. 
and then it's half-hearted beyond belief. Well, we'll get into the French carriers later. This is... Just because you have the allocation doesn't mean you need to do anything. But also... The British could have got a lot better for their tonnage. If you look at what they're getting for their tonnage and what others are getting from their tonnage for aircraft. But there are, of course, differences in how you count aircraft numbers. The British count complete, serviceable machines. Not spare parts, not things stuck up in rafters, and not things stuck on the flight deck. But if you can get away with counting those things, it does make your numbers look absolutely mahusive and cool as anything. So, here are the treaties which cover carriers. The Washington Treaty. Always a fun one. Always a good book to look for it. Article 7. Total ton aircraft carriers of each of the contracting parties of powers shall not exceed in the standard displacement for the United States 135,000 tons, British Empire 135,000 tons, France 60,000 tons, Italy 60,000 tons, and Japan 81,000 tons. No aircraft carrier exceeding 27 tonnes metric sanitation shall be required by or constructed by, for or within the jurisdiction of any of the contracting powers. Then, of course, comes their exception for two 33,000 tonne aircraft carriers. We go back, we have a look, let's see who builds their 33,000 tonne aircraft carriers. Well, the Royal Navy certainly don't. Um... Akagi and Kaga? No. <sighs> Saratoga and Lexington. 33,000 tons on the drop. And they show it. They have 80 aircraft. They have 180 for how the shaft horsepower. A top speed of 34 knots. They are longer, wider, and more heavily armed than anything else out there. Okay, maybe Furious has a number on them in terms of having five point, more, almost as many 5.5-inch guns, but she's lost her 18-inch guns, so she ain't taking them on in a fight. I still wonder what would have been the decision of the treaties, the actual word in treaties, if Furious had still had her single 18-inch gun somewhere, somehow aboard her. I would love to see how they got round that in writing. No carrier should be allowed more than one gun of 18 inches. <laughs> Every carrier a single gun monitor. <laughs> oh, that could be funny. Ah, well. Right. No vessel of war exceeding 10,000 tons, standard spaceman other than a capital ship or aircraft carrier, shall be acquired by or constructed by, for within the jurisdiction of any contracting powers, vessels, uh, powers. Vessels not specifically be built as fighting ships, nor taken in time of peace under government control for fighting purposes which are employed on the fleet duties, or as troop transports, or in some way for the purpose of assisting in the prosecution of hostilities, otherwise than as fighting ships, shall not be within the limitations of this article. Now, of course, this thing does limit them to 8-inch guns, which is just cruel, you know. Again. Where's my 18-inch gun? Article 3 of the London Treaty. For the purposes of Washington Treaty, definition of aircraft carrier given in Chapter 2, Part 4 of said treaty is hereby replaced by the following definition. The expression aircraft carrier includes any service vessel of war 
whatever its displacement, designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft, and so constructed that aircraft can be launched there from and landed there all because there's been a small loophole left in that if it's less than 10,000 tons, it doesn't count. Which is why there is the uh, why there is the Ryujo there. With that very interesting look. Anyway, leaving that to one side. The fitting of a landing on or flying off platform or deck on a capital ship, cruise or destroyer, provided such vessel was not designed or adapted exclusively as an aircraft carrier, shall not cause any vessel so fitted to be charged against or classified in the category of aircraft carriers. Anyone here want to try and make a 1,850 ton aircraft carrier? I can just imagine, well, these days with helicopters, it might actually work in terms of carrying a useful air group. What am I saying? No, it wouldn't. Uh, if you have no guns, no sensors, just engines, hull, and a large hangar. We could get a few helicopters on there. Maybe some joint strike fighters. I wouldn't really want to try it. No aircraft carrier of 10,000 tons or less standard displacement mounting a gun above 6.1 inch caliber shall be acquired by or constructed or by or for any of the high contracting parties. As from the um, as from the coming into force of the present treaty, in respect all high contracting parties, no aircraft carrier of ten thousand tons or less stand displacement mounting a gun above six point one inch ca caliber shall be constructed within the jurisdiction of any of the high contracting parties. Basically, you can't build them for yourself or for anyone else. An aircraft carrier must not be designed and constructed for carrying a more powerful armament than authorized by Article 9 or Article 10 of the Washington Treaty, or Article 4 of the present treaty, as the case may be. Well, this is going to limit everyone to AA guns, isn't it? That's the plan. That really was the plan. So you've got treaties, you've got a paper, which starts off by defiantly declaring they're not capital ships. But you have treaties, which are limiting their numbers to the point to which they're strategic assets. And this is the really interesting thing. Because often when you look at those treaties, people go, ooh, well, they obviously didn't want a lot of them. Well, if they didn't think they were valuable or useful, they wouldn't be limiting them. Especially not in the first treaty. The first treaty was all about stopping a dreadnought race. And it was the Americans worrying about Britain building a whole generation of superhoods. And then whatever came next. And the British worrying about the Americans just building. So... Carriers were ancillary. You can read the Washington Treaty. The limitations for cruisers, destroyers, sloops, none of them are prescriptive. 
as they are for carriers and battleships or capital ships. Suddenly known to value them. They're setting a viable limit. So they're not capital ships, but they are capital assets from their very beginning because of what they bring to the party. And what do aircraft carriers bring to the party? A mobile global aerodrome. Aircraft are great, but they need to rearm, they need to refuel, their pilots need to sleep, and they need to be maintained. And whilst you can always, in theory, build a land plate of a uh, land facility to do that, in practice, the pragmat uh, the pragmatic scenario might not allow that. Reality gets messy. Whereas a floating aerodrome can turn up at your will and whim, wherever you want it, whenever you want it. And they're rather helpful like that. You know. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching part two, and I hope you'll join me for part three. Should be coming up in a couple of hours. Or might be a link straight away in the end screen. Depending on when you're watching this. Take care. Thank you.